mock debate presented by two former members of the City Academy Debating Club. Uh, just a small person coming up. City Academy Debating has uh, going on in the school since at least 1884. I wasn't here then. <laughs> <laughs> Probably before then. Um, uh, the last 35, 40 years, we've produced a very modern, successful kind of team. Uh, City Academy has won something like 25 provincial titles in the last 35 years or so. We lost count. At one point, we won 19 out of 20 provincial championships. We won two national titles. In fact, we invented the national competition. First one was held here. And we are the only team in North America to win the North American Debating Challenge. It was held one year in Montreal, and it wasn't held after that. <laughs> my point, arguably, arguably, is that we are still the reigning North American Debating Challenge. Yeah. <laughs> what year was that? What year? That's why they, they blend together. Um, we are also the only public school to belong to the North, to the New England private school debating league. They moved us in after the four or five years of competing with it. We are very successful. We travel a lot. We've debated in places like Singapore, Johannesburg, Lima, Frankfurt, London. Edinburgh, all over Canada, LA. Um, we had a famous trip to LA on February. Um, there was a storm leaving the West and a shovel turned my driveway. Barely got to the airport, flew to LA. It was 74 degrees. We stayed there eight days. As far as I could tell, it stayed 74 degrees. I flew back and shoveled into my driveway. <laughs> it occurred to me about the kitchen in the wrong place. So we've been all over the world. Um, we were very successful. Um, perhaps the pinnacle of our success was in 2006 in, in Wales, in Carlisle. Uh, Canadian team, I was coaching the team at the time. And three Nova Scotians on it. Kids from Halifax, two Sydney Cadillacs. And we lost the semi final in the World Championship by a Irish team. Was that funny? But <laughs> you're saying it. I like to think so. <laughs> Now the Irish team uh, and the judges were one from England, one from Scotland, one from Wales. Uh, I don't know. I can't. I don't want to say that. I mean, the point is, um, just like figure skating. The point is, next year we went to Scotland. Uh, we faced that team in a private debate. We beat the heck up. So we felt we had some revenge. So we've done very well, and we continue to do well. And we have two products of that success here. Um, we're doing a mock debate today. Point out, not a demonstration debate, not an exhibition debate, but a mock debate. So we're trying to see some of the loiter aspects of debating and have a little fun. You might see some overextension and so on, or maybe even some silliness. Uh, it's a demonstration of what debaters can do and how they think and, and the process of debating and, and logic and conclusions and so on. The Prime Minister in the House is Wesley Crawford, class of 2008, I think. Was uh, as you all know, I'm sure, has single-handedly almost wrestled Canadian or well, Britain theater uh, to a new level of violence. I'd like to think they learned all of that in the debating room. Uh, the leader of the opposition and the own opposition member in this debating duel is Liam Gillis, of course. Liam, class of? 2007. 2007. Um, Wesley's going to have five minutes to make a case. The resolution is, this house believes that Cape Breton should secede from Canada. They're here. Oh. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so there's some tongue-in-cheek argument going on here, but that's the resolution, we'll see how Wesley will define that. In the first five minutes, he will define the terms, give us his arguments. Followed by seven minutes from Liam, as the opposition leader, and remember the opposition, uh, who will say, no, you're wrong, because. Two different case lines. Why does he get seven minutes? He only gets five. Not finished yet. Thank you very much. So three minutes Wesley after that, which is the rebuttal aspect for the Prime Minister, and then we the change now. We then give one minute to Liam for rebuttal to rebuttal. So they each speak uh, two times at different time limits. When that's over, I'm going to ask them to sort of stay in character and see if there are any questions from the audience about their cases and so on. What they would have thought or what they would have left out or how silly they were in the case may be. So I'll give you a few minutes for that. We're not going to have a judging situation. We don't care who wins, we would like debating to win. Uh, and by the way, you have some reading material on your chairs. 
<laughs> I'm look at it when you get an opportunity. I want to talk to you about it, then listen to you. Nicholas, of course, is our, our, our timer. Nicholas will be ruthless with the time, <laughs> given yes. certain situations. <clears throat> I call upon the Prime Minister for his opening remarks. Question. Thank you very much, Mr. Kite, Mr. Gillis, and of course, all of you. The resolution before the House today, be it resolved that Cape Breton should secede from Canada. And we define the terms as such, Cape Breton, of course, being our beloved island in which we all, if not uh, live, at least are currently stationed at this moment. Uh, Canada being the alleged uh, former country that Cape, that Cape Breton has historically been a part of for the past several decades. And secede, we define as blowing up the Cancel Causeway in a defiant and uh, glorious act of rebellion and declaring Cape Breton an independent nation. Uh, we have a, a, a bit of a case line, I guess, why we think that is necessary. Some of you may think it's drastic, however, in the next five minutes, I hope you'll be swayed. Uh, over the past several years, Cape Breton has become far too reliant on government assistance and it's, uh, in the form of unemployment insurance, the form of, the form of uh, summer job grants, and it is unfairly, first of all, unfairly distributed within the province of Nova Scotia. Secondly, of course this is unsustainable. It is not beneficial in the continued prosperity of Cape Breton. So we believe that the, the only course of action is to cut ties and to force the inhabitants of Cape Breton to pull up their bootstraps, as it were, and to take responsibility for their own economic success. Uh, we have three main arguments, the first being uh, that of natural resources of Cape Breton and the potential for self-sustainability. The second argument is that of the Cape Breton identity, and the third, that of unique geological or geographical resources, which we'll get to thirdly. So first of all, Cape Breton sustainability. Cape Breton is uniquely situated in that we are in perhaps the perfect ecological position to be able to sustain our own independence. We have, uh, of course, a long-standing history with coal. We have uh, now wind turbines, which have become uh, very feasible uh, power source, which I'll talk about more later. And then, of course, we're perfectly situated in the water, we have fishing industry, we have great agricultural potential. There's no reason that we can't have enough resources, if properly uh, generated and, and uh, distributed, to be able to sustain without relying on Canada. By declaring our own independence as a nation, we would be able to implement policies that would encourage and, and promote uh, the eternal use of, of Cape Breton resources, Cape Breton local products, uh, through the use of uh, uh, using, uh, making a priority for Cape Breton business owners, farmers, fisheries. We, rather than going to the cheapest source and outsourcing, we would be able to keep all of our resources internal and by doing so hopefully create prosperity for all. For the past generation, we've been mired in an economic sinkhole, and there, we need to do something. What we've been doing is not working, where, where we can't rely on uh, the hope of government handouts or the hope of Chinese investments. We have to take responsibility, and that has to begin with, our, with the resources that we already have. Secondly, the Cape Breton identity. If you go anywhere else in Canada, who is more proud than the Cape Bretoner? Certainly not Toronto. If you go to Toronto, they don't even know that they're in a, 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 a province. They think there's a center of the universe. We in Cape Breton know that we are. And if, if anything is to come from the dozens of countries that have immigrated over the, over the centuries, the people who have brought parts of their culture, uh, I, I would report that we have a very unique situation here. We have not only the people, perhaps the greatest people in the world, even if they have their cell phones turned on. <laughs> Uh, but we have we have the, the benefit of all of these cultural influences which have come and stayed and kept the, the best parts of those cultures to create something entirely new and unique. And that's something that should be celebrated. That's something that I would say the rest of Canada does not have, and, and having lived different places in Canada, I, I have never seen in, in greater abundance than, than this island. Uh, and last, in, in my last minute, I will talk about the unique combination of natural, uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, the natural resources. Now, we have always depended 
for our major economy, something to do with this land, this island. First of all, coal. For many, many years, coal was the, the main sustaining income of, of this island. Uh, the steel plant, for almost 100 years, created a huge economy. We have two things which I think would be of great potential. Number one, wind turbines. We have the potential geology in this island to sustain uh, North American, to, to power all of North America if we were to invest in wind turbines. Secondly, I believe that by becoming an independent nation, we could have great success as a tax haven. Uh, <laughs> think, about, think about what these few things have in common. Bermuda, Bahamas. I'm not talking about the Beach Boys song. Virgin <laughs> Islands, Cayman Islands, and the Cook Islands. All are tax havens. They're also all islands. I, I, I'm out of time, so I'll say no more. Thank you very much. I also point out that the two debaters can also ask each other questions during the operation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to uh, my friend across the aisle, the Prime Minister. I apologize, he sounded a lot like uh, our friends across the pond, Boris Johnson and the Brexiters over in England with that speech he just gave. <laughs> what we heard from Mr. Johnson, or should I say Mr. Colford, was how we could separate from Canada. We didn't necessarily hear why we should separate from Canada. I didn't hear the, the dire circumstances that Cape Breton finds itself in. I didn't hear about the problems with our continued association with Canada. We merely heard, heard an alternative. information. Yes. Are you aware that in a recent study, Cape Breton or the Sydney region was voted the third worst city to live in in Canada due to economic strife, poverty, unemployment? Are you aware? I'm aware, and I'd rather be the third worst city in Canada than the third worst country in the world. And that's where we would find ourselves, should we leave Canada, amongst the lower ranks of Western nations, assuredly. Now, I have three arguments that I'm going to bring, or my case line first I'm going to propose to you today is that existing within the Canadian Federation provides us with the most flexibility in our attainment and pursuit of a Western world standard of living. There's three arguments I'm going to propose to you on that note. The first, I'm going to talk about economic prosperity. The second, I'm going to talk about security. And the third, I'm going to talk about political power. Now, on to that first argument of economic prosperity. I want you to look out that window. And what do you see? You see buildings. You see roads. You're standing in a school. Now I want to put you to put yourself in the shoes of someone born in 1866, the year before Canada, Cape Breton joined Canada in 1867, along with Nova Scotia. What did you see? You probably saw farmland, if any. You certainly didn't see many buildings. You certainly didn't see hospitals that provided free health care. You probably weren't standing, you certainly weren't standing in this building with free education. A simple before and after analysis would seem to suggest that Cape Breton's are far better off as a part of Canada in 2016 than they were before in 1866. Would you not agree that it was in fact the creation of the steel plant, the Sydney Steel Plant, and the colossal boom in employment that is responsible for much of the urbanization or, or the time modernization of this area? Oh, certainly, but I would suggest to you that the creation of the steel plant was prior, prior, predominantly dependent upon having access to world markets, and that came about through the joining of Canada and through our relationship, well, now in the 19, 1990s, as you see post-NAFTA, uh, not with the steel plant, but with other goods and other exports. Now, our association with Canada allows us to receive millions of dollars through equalization payments. That provides us with a high standard of living. Overall, Confederation has been a net positive. Where would we get our money if we left Canada? Surely there is a limit on the amount of Chasey Ace events we would hold in Cape Breton. <laughs> Secondly, there's no guarantee that we would have freedom of movement that we now enjoy in Canada. In that respect, secession may play well to the romantic, or maybe a romantic idea to the cultural elites of Sydney. It may play well in Charlotte Street, but I'm sure it won't play well with the Fort McMurray diaspora. It has allowed culture to flourish. We have at least 30 dialects of broken English in Cape Breton. I don't know if you would see that if we weren't in Canada. We currently enjoy the many benefits of the North American Free Trade Agreement, soon to be the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and a recently negotiated internal agreement on trade with other Canadian provinces. As our own nation, there's no guarantee we'd be a part of these agreements. And certainly, as a small country of approximately 100,000 people, 
there'd be little priority to negotiating any type of trade agreement with, with us given our small stature. When you think about it, what incentive would any of these great global powers, such as whatever's left of Canada and North and the United States, have any incentive at all to come to the table and deal with Cape Breton? Our top export is world-class fiddle players, not oil. <laughs> we would have an abysmally low Cape Breton dollar, and our purchasing power would collapse. The cost of goods would increase tenfold. It would lead to a severe shortage of Cape Breton staple food items, such as Captain Morgan rum and Napoli's pizza. <laughs> the Cape Breton... Wait a minute. Yes. Is that the pizza not a perfect example of the, the resources we have and can make use of, along with great breweries, such as the Breton Brewery Company? I have a hard time believing that that pepperoni and that great cheese was not imported from outside of Cape Breton and not produced directly here. But moving on to my second argument, that of security. How would Cape Breton guarantee its security? We'd no longer be a member nation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. They would no longer be obligated to defend us should we be attacked. And it would leave us open to be attacked by a foreign power, one that exists just off our coast, eastern coast here in the form of St. Pierre et Miquelon, which is controlled by France. Surely, surely the member of the Prime Minister would agree that an invasion from St. Pierre and Miquelon would not be in our best interest. We have little military assets, so to speak of. I don't know if anyone has been out the fortress of Louisbourg lately, but it is not equipped for modern warfare. It hasn't been updated in centuries. We would have one wing land link to the rest of continental North America and it would be highly vulnerable. In fact, it's so vulnerable that the Prime Minister has already proposed blowing it up. Thirdly, we have extensive political power as, it, as is. We have two members of Parliament for approximately 130,000 people, which is far more than the rest of the country. We have two members of Parliament currently within a majority government. Uh, the principal advisor to Mr. Trudeau blew up in, Gle in Glace Bay, Gerald Butts. Lisa Ray, who grew up in Whitney Pier, is a top conservative leadership candidate. Jeff McCullen is a top cabinet member provincially. Only seven years after Rodney McDonald, a Cape Bretoner from Inverness, was Premier of Nova Scotia. In the past, we've had great politicians such as Alan McCachran of Inverness, who was Deputy Prime Minister and a prominent member in both Pearson and Trudeau governments. David Dinwall, who was a prominent Cape Bretoner in the, in the Gretchen government. And we have Elizabeth May, who's currently the leader of the Green Party. Cape Breton identity has been flourishing under the current system. <laughs> By comparison, if you look at other, you can exist within the Canadian Federation as a small island and do very well. All we have to do is look at Prince Edward Island, approximately 100,000 people, and they produce great senators such as Mike Duffy. <laughs> <laughs> so for those three arguments, the economic, the economic prosperity argument, the, uh, the security argument and the political power argument, that is why we as the opposition believe that Cape Breton must be, remain a part of Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in those lovely, hilarious seven moments, Mr. Gillis addressed a, a number of reasons why he believed that the status quo was working. However, all one has to do is walk through the pothole-infested streets of Sydney to realize that this is, this is simply not the case. Uh, he talked a lot about his points without really giving a lot of attention to the initial arguments. Uh, that's all right, I will allow those to stand. Uh, I will talk, however, a little bit about the, the alleged economic prosperity the, and the political power that he's asserted is happening. Now, he listed a lot of uh, people who have, Cape Breton have been success, successful in politics, however, what he neglected to mention is what they have done to actually benefit Cape Breton economy and, and Cape Breton culture. Uh, he used PEI as an example of the, the flourishing uh, island in Canada. However, what he neglected to mention is that Prince Edward Island is its own province. We are standing in the offices of Nova Scotia, and the, the amount of taxation versus representation is not equitable, uh, despite the members that he's listed allegedly having great influence. We aren't seeing that, uh, we aren't seeing the return of that investment in our people. If we were able to make everything uh, totally independent, we would have the benefit of those great politicians. However, they would be here working for us and negotiating those uh, international policies, negotiating those trade agreements on our behalf, purely on behalf of Cape Breton, as opposed to secondarily. Uh, yes? Surely you're aware that Mr. Roger Cusner just announced a major Canadian grant to the CBU. 
that would not be available under the under it. We see it in Canada, would it not? Well, uh, who is to say? Who is to say? Uh, he talked about the lack of, uh, uh, of oil. However, as I mentioned, wind turbines is the way of the future. Oil is not a sustainable economy. That's all we're seeing the result of that already. Uh, already in, in result of both the uh, horrific events in Fort McMurray, but also just in, in looking at any, any stance in the economy. Uh, if we were to take the same resources and invest them on the resources that we already have, Napoli was an example. There are amazing Cape Breton local businesses that have flourished and would flourish even more if we were to create an incentive for people to exclusively turn to our local distributors, our local uh, craftsmen, farmers, breweries, what, what have you. He mentioned what perhaps is the most damning piece of evidence on his side, which is that of Chase the Ace. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but in, in my eyes, this is the perfect example of using the resources we have, and instead of turning out wasteful dollars towards the, the lotto, the four, and any of the national lotteries, we took that upon ourselves. A small community raised up to create a lottery system that was smaller, but in fact mightier. And because of the attention of Cape Breton, because of the, the resources that we have being channeled into that small state, people are now millionaires that never would. <laughs> Surely that is a testament of Cape Breton pride, Cape Breton identity, Cape Breton resources, we have resources, we have money. Let's stop giving it to Walmart. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. The Prime Minister gave me three arguments today. That of natural resources potential. He talked about how we have an abundance of them and those can be further used if we left this country. However, he didn't actually tell you why there's a problem right now. Why, not, why couldn't a charter be given to the Cape Breton like Halifax? Why couldn't we exist within a maritime union? Why couldn't we simply advocate uh, for, for more federal funding? He didn't actually talk about how there was a problem. Secondly, or why those resources couldn't be used in the current framework. Secondly, he talked about Cape Breton identity. I argue that that's flourishing under the current system. There's no shortage of, 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 of Cape Bretoners who have succeeded and have become internationally famous uh, under the current system. And thirdly, he talked about geographic potential. Potential that would not, would not be any greater or less if we were to leave. Cape Breton exists where it exists. It has lots of potential, and that potential exists within the current framework. What we didn't hear from the member of Prime Minister today was the strongest argument on his side, that if we were to separate from our own, our own country, uh, the Sydney Academy debating team would probably have 20 national championships, considering all those host tournaments would be judged by Cape Breton's. But we didn't hear any of that from Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you. Questions or points from the floor, either of the, to the Prime Minister or the Leader of the Opposition? I think the Prime Minister has a good, uh, uh, good point. Chase the ace, <laughs> win sustainability, and a uh, third one, we're not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the idea of debating the TV national champion of the year would be a good idea. It speaks to me. <laughs> <laughs> That was, of course, a mock look at how the debate takes place. The topic was considered, of course. Uh, and there were, there were jokes raised and overextensions, obviously. Um, but to all of that, of course, the point was, do you see something about the real political situation? Has Cape Breton been given a fair deal all those years by the Federation? The national policy of 1979 reflected most pain on the Cape Breton. Commonly said by historians, in 1867, 1866, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, was a prosperous and province. Sequentially, after the Federation had changed over two generations. So there's a kind of an argument here. Nobody's saying we should actually secede, although blowing up the cosmic feels to me. Dramatically, it's a no dramatic. Uh, it's how a debate can show those kinds of processes. I thank both these young men, young men uh, for giving us a good look at what debate can do and how we have more fun with it and uncover sometimes some real things that are fundamental. Future politics. I wouldn't do that to either one of